I'm Allison Singer with the Autism Science Foundation, and I'm here today with Dr. Haley Speed. She is one of our 2011 postdoctoral fellows. She's working with Dr. Craig Powell at the University of Texas Southwestern. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. So Haley, your work looks at synaptic connectivity in genetic mouse models. Talk to me a little bit about what we know about the role of synapses in autism. So what our lab is looking at are postsynaptic proteins that are involved in synapse maturation and synapse function. And what we're specifically looking at in this project is the shank 3 protein. And this protein acts as a scaffold for postsynaptic receptors and other proteins that help the postsynaptic side of the synapse function. In this case, shank 3 helps the postsynaptic cell respond appropriately to incoming information or neurotransmitter release from the presynaptic side. So why do we need to make mouse models? Well, we need mouse models because the experiments that we're doing are not possible in humans. We have imaging techniques that are possible in humans, but what we're looking for is synapse-specific mechanisms that are involved in autism. And right now the resolution is just not there with imaging. And so what we do is we take live slices from living brain tissue and we, an we analyze their function. And so what we want to know is what synaptic mechanisms in the living cell are disrupted in autism and how can we target those for treatment in the whole animal. And right now it's just it's not possible to do this in humans and it could potentially harm humans more than help. And so we do as much as we possibly can in the mouse before we move this into human treatment. So how eventually will this type of work translate into treatments for children or adults with autism? Well, what we're hoping to do is to take these living brain slices, and in our case, we're looking at the hippocampus. And what we want to do is identify those mechanisms that are messed up, and then we're going to apply pharmacological treatments, hopefully those that are already in existence, and see if we can rectify the deficits in these slices. And if we can do this in the living brain tissue in a, in a controlled laboratory setting, then we can do this into mice and analyze whether it's actually affecting their behavior or not. And if it is, we can promote this into clinical trials, hopefully fairly quickly. But if it isn't, we've also spared many, many resources and a lot of time from going through clinical trials that are not going to be effective. And so what we're doing is we're spending a little bit more time on the basic research side so that we can expedite those really, really uh, promising treatments that could possibly go into clinical trials. Is this type of model something that's been successful in other diseases? Are there things we can, or we can learn from other disease models? Absolutely. The FMR mouse model of autism, or Fragile X syndrome, which is an autism-associated syndrome, has had very successful um, trials with this already. They're looking at MBLUR and 5 antagonists, and they're going to clinical trials now, which hopefully will be available in the near future for autistic patients. And we're hoping to follow a similar pathway to have more treatments for a broader range of autisms and not just one particular syndrome. And how many children with autism do we think are affected by the shank 3 mutation? It's a rare genetic mutation. The shank 3 is, is associated with Phelan McDermott syndrome. And what we want to do is to be able to take what we learned from the shank 3 mutation and the uh, chromosome 22 deletion syndrome, and we want to be able to apply that across a broader range of uh, autism syndromes. For example, shank 3 is a postsynaptic scaffolding protein, but there are other proteins as well, such as the neuroligin 3 uh, and the uh, neuroligin 2, as well as neuroligin 1 mouse models of autism, which are also showing us how postsynaptic proteins can be involved in autism-associated phenotypes in mice or behaviors in children. And so, Haley, we are here doing this interview at the IMFAR meeting. Uh, it's been great that there are so many postdoctoral fellows here. What's been your favorite part of the IMFAR meeting so far? So far, I would have to say the poster presentations, even though they're much shorter they, in, the, in duration, there's so many, so many more of them, I like being able to talk one-on-one -on -one with the presenter of the poster and get an idea of more instead of just you know, a quick question at the end of a, of a talk. I'd like to be able to sit there and go over their data and maybe talk about mine a little bit and how it can fit in. And I found that that's a better way to get collaborators in the future, and I just get much more excited when I can talk one-on-one. -on -one. Well, that's great. We're really enthusiastic to see the outcome of your work. Congratulations again on being an Autism Science Foundation postdoctoral fellow, and we look forward to hearing a lot more from you in the future. Thank you for funding my research, and thank you for having me here. I appreciate it.